Casey, what's up, friend? How you doing, dude? I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. Glad you're having me on. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great. I don't know what. Oh man, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, I always print out my introductions the night before, so I have them like good to go. And I didn't print yours out for whatever reason, and now That's I'm fine. not connecting to my printer. <laughs> So I'm trying to pull it up on my um, laptop. It's just not pulling up. So just give me like a minute or two if that's okay. No problem. No problem. Take your time, man. No big deal. Ugh. There it is. Okay. Raymond Nazon is a 50 year old. Is 50 years old and has been following a carnivore diet for over five years. Through his meat-based protocol and intermittent fasting, he's lost 80 pounds and has eliminated prediabetes, acne, GERD, rosacea, arthritic joints, diminishing eyesight, poor wound healing, constant brain fog, snoring, and insomnia, among others. Raymond has coached others on the carnivore diet for years, was the top, was the top meat RX carnivore coach, which company is now known as Rivero. He's also helped many get healthier along the way through his Instagram live chats and many other popular uh, podcast appearances and presentations. He was also featured in Men's Health for his Ripped Physique and Amazing Transformation. I met Raymond at KetoCon in 2023 in Austin, Texas earlier this year, which is the largest conference of this kind focused on metabolic health. His presentation titled Priming, Feasting, and Fasting, which was done with fellow coach Emily Harvo, who we hosted on episode 424 of Balanced Body Radio, recorded at Low Carb Denver 2023, was absolutely fantastic. You can find Raymond Nazon on Instagram at Raymond Nazon. How does that sound? That sounds great. God, real pro. Sound okay? Yeah, real good. You're you're pretty cool. <laughs> how was your <laughs> How was your return from the conference? Oh, that was awesome. So, well, I mean, the return was kind of like you know, uh, you're coming down from a cloud kind of thing, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, just and then and then starting off busy for home life and stuff. So trying to catch do up you, with the, with the clients too. Yeah. Do you coach? Do you coach full time? I do not. No, I have a real job. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. And then how long were you with uh, MeetRx? Uh, about a year, almost a year and a half. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm I'm still with them and I always think like I'm, I'm going to be done all the time. I have so much fun doing it that I don't mind getting like no pay for doing it. But right. That's exactly what it is. No pay yeah. for doing it. Right. It's no pay. $12 for a 30 minute session that always no, goes 45. No. Like right, you right. don't do that for the money. No, no, no way. You, no, you don't. And you actually like I felt like that was a little disfavor too, because people don't respect you as much either or nor respect your time as well. Yeah. As I totally when agree. I started getting a lot more expensive. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, how are you liking things with um, steak and butter girl? I love that again. when she went until she, you know, had to take her hiatus for her dad. But yeah, no, it was it was awesome. Uh, we we built a huge, great platform together there. Um, uh, I I pretty much helped her get, you know, to that next step. She, you know, when she started, she started with like uh, I think she was just getting at thirty people when I started wow. with her. Wow. And then uh, you know we blew up where last August we were at fifteen hundred. So this wow. is quite a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what was the hiatus? Uh, she, uh, her father is terminally ill in, in oh. China. So she had to go over there. So right gotcha. now she's just, uh, she's just with him. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah. And where is home base for you? Home base is Atlanta. Atlanta. Cool. That's yeah. great. Awesome. All right, dude. Well, um, yeah, we don't have any bosses or sponsors, so say whatever, promote whatever. I would love to just talk about your health story, obviously, your journey to carnivore, things you've noticed along the way, what it's yeah. been like with coaching people, you know, common pitfalls and things along those lines. And then I really wanted to get into um, the talk that you did, um, which really was wonderful. You and Emily did such a good job with that one. I talked about it on Scott Mazinski's podcast this morning. He interviewed me and I, I talked about that. How great wow, that breakout was so wow. yeah hopefully give you guys a good shout out but you you did amazing on that one um so yeah i would love to talk about some of those concepts so just keep it right in your wheelhouse dude you've got nothing to worry about you bet you bet you bet cool and then i will have this all edited and processed and and done by today i think we're scheduled out like five weeks on the release but everything will be done and i'll have it ready to go i'll send you everything that i have so i'll send you all the zoom links um i'll send you the edited and final audio that's all processed and everything. I'll send you some social media stuff. 
And just know when you get it, you don't need to wait for our release. If there is something you would like to do with it, if there's a place you want to share awesome. it or you want to release it as, as some of your own content or put it on another podcast, whatever, you, you can do whatever with it anytime. You can edit it. You can use it for your own marketing, like whatever. I'll, but just when you get it today, just know you have full permission to do whatever you like with it. The oh, no obligation. But... So I could put it on my YouTube and then just post it if you want. Go for it. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. go for it. So yeah, so I'll send... I'll send the raw Zoom. So all I do on Zoom is I just I I um upload the full Zoom video and then I just trim. So I'll trim yes. like right to when I start my introduction to right when I say, and this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'll just trim that and then that's what I use for my YouTube videos. So I'll send you the raw Zoom link, which will have the Zoom audio, which we don't use the Zoom audio for our audio. I use my mixer for that, but it will have the speaker view and the gallery view from Zoom, and it should allow you to download either one or both or whatever. And yeah, if you want to upload that to your YouTube, go right ahead, and you don't need to wait for us. Wow, you are totally pro on this. Awesome. Love it. No worries, brother. No worries. Yeah. Okay, well, if you're good to go, I'm good to go. I love that you're, uh, by the way, I love that you you have such tech skills, so this this is really handy. Yeah. yeah, I I just have to keep things so stupid simple. Like right. I I understand how people get such a following on places like Instagram, where I don't have as much of a following because I'm just like dumping stuff there. Where people like you are making such better, or like high quality things on Instagram and and YouTube that I just I don't have the time or patience for. I wish I would, but yeah. Anyway, I don't I don't mess with anything. That's Bella's wheelhouse. So oh, okay, there you go. I use her as my influencer to bring in for me. Nice. Mine is to try to keep people carnivore and to keep it long term. Cool. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, well, um, music will play on my end for like thirty seconds. I'll get you introduced, and we'll just get rolling from there. Perfect. Okay. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce you now. Raymond Nazon is, is 50 years old and has been following a carnivore diet for over five years. Through his meat-based protocol and intermittent fasting, he has lost 80 pounds and has eliminated, get ready for this list, prediabetes, acne, GERD, rosacea, arthritic joints, diminishing eyesight, poor wound healing, constant brain fog, snoring, and insomnia, among others. Wow. Raymond has coached others on his carnivore diet for years and was the top meat RX carnivore coach, which company is now known as Rivero. He's also helped many others get healthier as well as through his Instagram live chats and many popular podcast appearances and presentations. He was also featured in men's health for his ripped physique and amazing transformation. I met Raymond at KetoCon 2023 in Austin, Texas earlier this year, which is the largest conference of its kind focused on metabolic health. His presentation, titled Priming, Feasting, and Fasting, which was done with fellow coach Emily Harbo, who we've interviewed on episode 424 of Balanced Body Radio, recorded at Low Carb Denver 2023, was absolutely fantastic. You can find Raymond Nazan on social media, such as Facebook on, and Instagram, at Raymond Nazan. Raymond, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you for having me here, Casey. I'm excited. It's such an honor to have you. It was so cool to meet you in person. Emily introduced us. I apologize. My introduction was a little bit out of sorts. Normally, I have everybody's introduction printed out. I have it right in front of me, and I can read it. And for whatever reason, last night as I was finalizing it, I didn't print it. And now I don't have connection to my printer today for whatever reason. So I have to read it on a weird angle. And yeah, I apologize for stumbling over a few of the words. A little out of sorts. It sounded great. You did great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you. You've You've accomplished a lot. Just the one laundry list of all the things that you've been able to overcome in your life is really astounding. And I'm really excited to talk to you about your journey. Um, I did attend your breakout session that you did at KetoCon. It's kind of interesting, the format at KetoCon, where you kind of have to pick and choose. You can't really do everything. And so to go to your presentation, I had to miss a few other presentations, including the main, you know, on the main stage, the main presentation that was going on. I'm so glad that I stepped out to be able to do that. You and Emily did such a fantastic job. You could tell how engaged the audience was. You brought up some really cool concepts and got a lot of really good answers. So I'm excited to talk to you about that chat today. How did you and Emily end up hooking up? Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's a great question. So 
I actually started uh, over at uh, with Bella and grew the grew the steak and butter gang to a certain amount before Emily even came in. So, and that was about uh, uh, she came in about uh, I think we were growing it right around March, and then in June or July I saw Emily's story, and I was like damn, you know, 300 pounds down to like, you know, 170 or so uh, and uh, five years fasting. And I'm like, wow, there's such a similarity between our stories. So, you know, I, she was in the gang at the time and she was bragging about how, you know, she, she's an experienced faster, but she never had fasting so easy until she followed my program. And, uh, and she was just a, you know, bubbly promoter and stuff like that. And eventually I just uh, up and called her. I was like, Hey, you know, so I started talking to her and we started getting connection. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, I was like, Hey, uh, Bella even suggested this actually, can we write a workshop together to get this thing, you know, further on and pretty much by uh, August or I think it was August by August, we created a workshop and we started teaching it as a as as a team uh, to the folks. I've never done a group coaching before, so to have a group coaching that's going to be unknown. You know, I've got like uh, you know up to fifty people in the Zoom that's watching me at the same time. I'm giving them instructions as a group what to do weekly, and I didn't know how it was going to turn out. Well, she helped me go through it. Uh, we answered the questions that we needed to, and we evolved since then. And that's that's how we got together. That's amazing. What a chance meeting. You guys had such a synergy together. I'm sure those group meetings were very powerful. Um, it's definitely a one plus one equals three type of situation. The two of you together was pretty amazing. Emily was, I think, the first ever like surprise podcast guest on our show. I was doing a podcast appearance with Buzz and Bruce at Low Carb Denver, and I didn't have my full podcasting setup. We were just recording on the phone. And so she saw Buzz and Bruce. She's like, oh, hey, guys, what's up? And just sat down. I'm like, well, you just sat down in the middle of a podcast episode, so you're going to be in it. And I was blown away by her story. What an inspiration uh, she is. And, and to be able to go out and share that must mean a lot to her. And I know how much it means to you. So very cool to see that presentation. Yeah. And around that same time, too, we we started discovering because we, we we had a problem with a name. We're like, oh, what name should we pick for this? You know, feasting and fasting didn't sound totally sexy. Right. So and we came upon I don't know if you ever seen those statues where a man's chisel himself and then the woman's chiseling herself from a from an obese body to a very fit body. And, you know, we looked at ourselves, each one of us, me and her results look just like those statues. And we're like, you know what? That's called chisel. And uh, that's how chisel was formed. Yeah, I really love that. The, those pictures were striking. And it kind of reminded me that all of us are on this journey at, at different levels. And, you know, you walk around KetoCon and you see the attendees who are there. And it's certainly not the case that everybody is perfectly fit and is metabolically fit. But as you're starting to talk to some of the and attendees, you, you're learning that maybe they are just getting started on this journey. And, you know, maybe they've already lost 50 pounds. They might have another 50 to go, but we're all on that journey of constantly trying to heal ourselves from the damage that we've done from a terrible diet and lifestyle. So I thought the image was really striking. And I, I'm glad you guys explained that in the presentation and, and came up with that for the name. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And really, and honestly, we're, we're very careful because, you know, most of our audience uh, are sick, uh, you know, uh, they know they're sick. That's the best part, right? So they're doing something about it. And that's why I love what I, what what we do is you know we're we're non judgmental. We don't care how big you are; it doesn't matter. We know that as long as you eat the right food and fast a certain way, at least your ailments are going to be manageable. We're not guaranteeing or even saying that your outward appearance will change at all. That's a bonus for me. That was a bonus. You know, for me to look like this was a. I was not after that. I was after pain minimization, you know what I mean? Just, just getting my pain down <laughs> without drugs. And it just did all of this for me, which is incredible. Wow. Yeah, that's absolutely bananas to be able to accomplish so much. Let's talk about that journey. Before we can talk about your story of recovery, we have to talk about your story of sickness. So I read an abbreviated, by the way, list of conditions and things that you were dealing with. I had to cut some things out of that. So that would take up the entire introduction. 
man, how, how did you get so sick? What, what, what kind of led you down that path? What things did you notice first and how did that continue? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. First of all, so uh, as as a young kid, I actually grew up in Cape Asian Haiti. So really, uh, during that time, I was having real foods. You know, we maybe had a, like a one Coca-Cola in like a bottle size where we shared it as a family once a week or something like that. So, you know, that was... Uh, that, that, so I was fairly healthy until I came to the United States when I was 13 for high school. And when I came from high school, uh, all I knew was these uh, chimichangas and burritos uh, that I would microwave. And, uh, you know, I discovered that I can have unlimited Pepsi, you know, and that's all I did, you know, throughout. I was uh, the hungry man, the, just pretty much a microwave junk. So it's like the worst of the worst types diet I could have done. And I did that all the way through until I met my wife at uh, 33. Um, and she started, you know, kind of getting me to eat her type Bulgarian diet from there. But really, I really did a lot of damage to myself by eating, I mean, uh, garbage, really garbage. Yeah, I didn't exactly. drink. I didn't do I didn't do drugs or anything like that. It's just seriously the garbage that did it for me. Yeah, it's it's that combination of fat and carbohydrates that come together in, in those packaged foods that you're talking about. And yeah, I mean, if if you grew up in Haiti and, and Coca-Cola was kind of a rarity or a treat coming to the United States, much has been amazing to have all this wonderfully looking delicious food that's so convenient and inexpensive, it would be hard not to overconsume it. It was. And not only that, uh, you know, I overdid it. So at first, you know, with the with the Pepsi, you know, I was drinking like a liter at a time. Uh, by the time I was in my, uh, I don't know, like uh, senior year, I was drinking two, two liters. So I was drinking a gallon of Pepsi a day. I would not drink water. I would not drink water. I mean, I, I, I you know, you, you never hear that it's unhealthy for you. So, and, and it felt good. It tasted good. My problem is that, is that I was getting the hit, but it took more and more to get the hit. So that's why I kept on drinking more and more. Yeah. That's astounding. So when did the health problem start? The health problem really started. Um, I mean, honestly, I, if you really want to be honest, oh, by the way, I did all, also a lot of fast food too. Um, I think I had an event, like a heart event around in my 20s. Uh, that was, yeah, it, it, like 29, 30-ish, uh, somewhere around there. But I remember the time where I had to actually stop the car and pull over the side of the road. My my left side was all numb, and uh, I felt uh, I felt like something was going on. I didn't do an ambulance or anything like that, but you know I had to actually pause for a while. That was my first instant of like a real incident that I've had. Otherwise than that, I you know I didn't feel too bad. I didn't have the sleep apnea, all, all of this stuff. Oh yeah, I always had really bad skin. So that that was probably the only thing, like acne, serious acne, rosacea, stuff like that. But uh, I functioned. I functioned, so I thought I was healthy. Were you gaining weight at the same time? Gaining weight, that's a good question. So gaining weight, I really started gaining a lot more weight by the time I started going uh, like about 18. Uh, by 33, I was just pretty much, uh, but I would gain and then try to lose, right? So I was able to lose also depending on my physical activity and all that kind of stuff. But by the time I was 33, it didn't matter what I did. I could not lose weight. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people can get away with doing it maybe once, maybe, maybe twice in their life where they lose weight by calorie restricting and starting an exercise program. And you can white knuckle it for a while. You're probably going to gain the weight afterwards. But it seems like after that first or maybe second time, it just gets so much harder and harder and harder to have that same effect because of the impact you're making on your own metabolism. Exactly. And now really, I was gaining every single year. So every year, I would try to try to, you know, get a little bit of decrease, but it, it, it just kept on stacking on itself. And like I said, no matter what I did after 33, that, that was it. It's just useless. So, you know, I even I even got into the, uh, the was that like master cleanse and doing like little, little fast and all that. But all I did was double my weight later on. So it was really useless. Yeah, it's, it's alarming to some people when I tell them that doing that calorie restriction and over-exercising is actually causing the eventual weight gain. And I wish I could just stop every person that runs by me in the morning 
you can tell they're working out because they want to lose weight or control their weight. And it's like, you're, you're causing weight gain. It's going to happen. It sucks. It's you're, it's going to be hard to imagine, but if you've done the diet before, you know, what's going to happen. It's not willpower either. Exactly. It's not. And that's the thing. When I, when I went through this, uh, and I was diagnosed as pre-diabetes, you know, I, I thought there was a way out just by working out harder. Right. And I did that for seven months, seven months. I gained a pound. I was, don't get me wrong, I, I, I was running a little bit better instead of walking. I, I, I did gain a little endurance and a little, a little strength, but nothing else. Pain was uh, more so than when I first started. In an hour's workout did absolutely nothing. But in two weeks of doing low carb meat and greens, I shed like 10 pounds and looked like I shed 30 pounds. That's crazy. Yeah, I see that all the time. I think you told Scott Mislinski it was the wasn't it a wake up call that you had that really triggered you to give it one last go and you'd actually did like orange theory something that most yeah. people would consider like wow, very high intensity, lots of breathing heavily and sweating and and you did feel like you gave that a really hard try. It wasn't like you weren't trying, you were actually going and getting very hard workouts done. Yeah, I mean, I I I started off with one day a week cuz I barely could even do that. But I got up to the point I was doing six to seven days a week. Wow. I really gave it because, you know, my life depended on it because they told me I had prediabetes and they're like, you're going to be diabetic. You know, you can kind of manage it with uh, with uh, with exercise. And uh, they said diet, too. But I didn't want to sit to that part. Uh, but and I tried the exercise and I thought if I tried the exercise hard enough and took it serious enough, that that would change things. And it absolutely did not. Yeah, that's such a shame. And again, I don't want to talk a bunch of smack on a program that's, you know, what's out there and it's trying to help people move. But it's like when I'm when I was using metabolic carts to validate heart rate zones and show people where they were burning fat the most, the intensities that places like that are pushing are way, way above the intensity where you're actually burning a maximum amount of fat. And again, most people don't know that. And so they're so focused on the calories. They want to do a 45 minute or 60 minute class where they're pushing those high heart rates for so long. Those are sugar burning, carbohydrate burning activities. And they burn so many total calories. They have that negative impact on your metabolism. So you're literally teaching yourself to be more efficient, more miserly with your calories. You're only burning sugar and carbohydrates and hanging on to all the fat. What's going to happen to your cravings and your willpower and all that stuff? It sucks. It's too bad because it's a lot of work. And it's not sustainable. Let's be yeah. honest. Yeah. yeah. And I found out out too. Um, how, let me tell you, when I went to the uh, meat and greens part, I was like, I did all this for very little result for, for the workout. And then this was just like almost instant. I'm like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, Hey, it's in the food. That's where it matters. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So what was it that triggered that change for you? What made you start to focus on food more and why was it meat and vegetables that you decided to focus on? Yeah. So it was actually really simple. So, uh, because I had it in my mind that they told me exercise and, uh, and uh, diet change will help mitigate the diabetes to go forward that fast. So I, 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 I thought I'd give it a good shot, which seven months I thought was a good shot. I should have seen something, right? Which I didn't with the exercise. So then I decided to Google like how to cure diabetes. Back then Google wasn't all you know uh, messed up. So when you did that diet doctor uh, came up first. So I started reading on Diet Doctor and I started, you know, I'm all about testimonials because I'm like, if somebody else could do it. And, you know, I'm reading these horror stories of these people that, that are like injecting themselves with insulin and getting off of that. And I'm like, wow, I'm not even there. So, you know, maybe diet would work for me. So that's where I was like, all right, I'm just going to give it a shot that I didn't, I didn't realize a timeline was kind of important for me in that time. So when Orange Theory, they'll, they'll have little contests and they had a six weeks contest. And I was like, you know what? Six weeks is doable. Cause I can't think of doing this thing for the rest of my life. That's what I told myself. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be doing any diet change for the rest of my life, but I can do it for six weeks. So I did it for six weeks and, uh, and it was great, obviously. And then, um, uh, and then the, the thing is, the more I read on Diet Doctor, I found out there's a lot high fat um, and low carbs, right? But there was so much information about what the low carb is, right? So I was like, okay, meat and greens. 
Let's make it simple. I don't want to read into like journals and journals of stuff, getting your earth at all and all that kind of stuff. I was like, just put it in my mind, meat and greens. And that's what I did. The second time around when I tried it again, I was like, I hate the greens. Why am I doing the greens? Can I live on meat alone? And that's when I started researching that part of it. Yeah, so interesting. Diet Doctor was such a valuable resource for me when I was getting started with some of this stuff to see the testimonials, to read the articles, all the movies they had, the meal planning tools, really amazing. Even the resources that they had, you know, kind of on the back of the website where you could go and find all these other websites that you would have never found really on your own and how they were compiling them all together. I, I, I'm lamenting a little bit the direction they're going. It's harder for me to share them around with people, but that was such an amazing resource and they've done such a great job with that work. So, so how, what, what results did you see in those first six weeks? Uh, the first six weeks, like I said, I, I lost 10 pounds and look like I lost 30 pounds. You know, I mean, coworkers were stopping me and saying, what are you doing? You know, it's like, and, and this is in a couple of weeks, obviously it was a lot of inflammation. You know, I had really inflamed face, you know, inflamed everything, but uh, again, 10 pounds, not a big deal. Right. Especially at my height, which was 252 pounds, what would 10 pounds do? But we're talking about, I look like I lost 30 pounds. So uh, I started feeling a little bit like my, uh, I started hitting PRs too in the gym. Uh, so I started noticing that I had a little bit more strength, umph. Uh, pain was still there, obviously. I mean, that lasted for a while. But otherwise than that, um, there, there, was, there was a lot of good results. Yeah, that it was it was hard to deny that there was something going good about this. Sure. And you're feeling good at the same time and knowing that you're heading in the right direction. What on earth gave you the idea that you should take out greens out of your diet? I hated greens. I hated greens. <laughs> so, you know, I here's the other thing. You know, I spent literally two hours every meal to cook. Right. So, you know, I'd have it. Of course, you know, I'd have some leftovers, so I didn't have to recook all the time. But what took the most time was the greens. I'm like cutting off the ends. I'm like sauteing it forever, getting the garlic, getting the, you know, uh, onions going, all of that. I mean, it was like, you know, after you make the mess, you got to clean up all of that. I mean, I was like, why am I doing all that? That's a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. I have benefits, but I was like, I don't even like this stuff. So the only reason I like it is because I have a lot of butter on it or something, you know, what I mean, <laughs> or some kind of fat on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> then I'm like, it, it, it's tolerable. At first, I thought I had to have it because, you know, that's what my nurse was saying. That's what everybody was saying. Make sure you have your green. So, you know, I believe that whole stuff. And uh, and then I was like, wow, there's got to be people out there that's probably got rid of the vegetables. So uh, that's when I started looking. Wow. And that was 2017. Okay. Okay. And who did you find? Who were some of the first people that you found that were actually yeah. doing a carnivore diet and they weren't dying? Right. So I ran into uh, Joe and Charlene Anderson. That was one of the first ones that I saw uh, that was impressed, very impressive to me because they were 20, uh, 20 year plus uh, carnivores. And then, of course, Kelly Hogan was next. Um, and uh, I saw this whole zeroing on health and saw, you know, Charles Washington, uh, uh, you know, Spencer. Um, there's so many names that I saw and they were like up there because I was looking for time. Right. How much Lisa Witterman was on them. Uh, how much time they've been in, in carnivore and okay, that hasn't killed them. So I was like, is it doable for me? So I also started, you know, reading a little bit about certain carnivores at that time I was looking at zero carbs in, and uh, she has a great website talking about how, how ill she was uh, Esme LaFleur. She was super ill, and the only thing that she could eat, I think, was uh, was raw meat at first, and then she just gained her her constitution from there and started living a normal life. And I'm like, well, wow, there's healing there too. So, didn't take me long to say, hey, you know what? I think we can live very well on that. Now, the thing is, is I did ask my nurse and my doctors about that. Oh no, 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 no! You're going to die of a heart attack. This is a bad idea. Don't do this. Um, they're like, oh, I heard the story of this guy that did this, you know, ended up having uh, uh, heart issues and stent replacement. And I'm like, okay. So I did try to gather enough information from a lot of people around me to see what they thought about it. But, you know, in the end, I, I realized that a lot of people were just speaking out of their butts. They really had no idea. And with the Inuits, that was a big seller for me too. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it is just so difficult 
to try to do something that that your doctor and nurses are saying you really shouldn't do you can't do like you you wonder in the back of your mind like maybe you know kelly hogan is sneaking some broccoli in the back or something like are they really truly following a zero carbohydrate diet and having zero vegetables it's it's hard it's hard to wrap your mind around yeah no it is and and, and that's the thing you know i have huge arguments with uh with my uh, uh with my sister for example she's like how do you know they're telling the truth and i was like well I guess you're right. I don't know. She's like the, the internet people make up stuff all the time. I'm like, I guess, but you know, I was like, what are the chances that you have like all these people coming up with <laughs> their stories and they're all lying about it? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like the chances are very minimal. You know, I do have a little critical mind that I can think that, you know, these testimonials are pretty real. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, that's great. Now, anecdotally, I could just say that I have heard many stories of vegans sneaking the bites of butter or eating oh, the yes. fish when nobody yeah. <laughs> nobody can see them. But I'd have a hard time picturing Sean Baker in the back of like a dumpster, like eating a bag of spinach. You know what I mean? Or asparagus like, or something. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> can bury it. I, I don't think we'll we'll catch those people doing that anytime soon. Wow. Okay. So on the carnivore diet, you decided to try it, I'm assuming, for that other six week period of time. Yeah, so uh, on the carnivore diet, I decided to do it for the six weeks period of time. But during that time, it was kind of drastic because I ended up with the uh, keto flu or carnivore flu, you want to call it. So, you know, which which proved to my nurse that I was killing myself. Uh, I actually did a blood pressure uh, uh, test and my blood pressure was sky high, highest it's ever been. Um uh, I also had a blood blood drawn and my cholesterol was super high. My trig, my even my trigs were high. Everything was high. Everything was bad. So I got the bejesus scared out of me. You know, they told me, look, you're just killing yourself. You need to get on this Mediterranean diet. Oh, we have this magical diet, you know, this Mediterranean diet. You know, th this is what you need to do. So I actually stopped uh, and went low carb ish for a long time, just on the advice for, it, it was it was about uh, five months until I saw Dr. Sean Baker when he was under Joe Rogan and that, that fueled me again to actually try it again. But um, I did low carb and followed more Dr. Jason Fung's uh, method of fasting. And that's why I really got introduced to fasting. Wow, interesting. Yeah, that episode of um, Joe Rogan's podcast with Sean Baker was the first time I had ever heard of carnivore, and I thought it was so ridiculous. I turned it off, and it wasn't until like last year I actually went back and re-listened to the whole thing in its entirety. It just seems like such a weird concept. It's cool that you already introduced to the diet before that, and that was just a way to kind of bring you back in. So you said you found Jason Fung's work, which was super influential in my life as well. So, so fasting was another component that you added in. How did that help things? Wow, fasting was great as far as for losing inches, for sure. Um, I just, you know, the problem with Dr. Fung's book, it's great, the OBC code, that was what was out at the time. I read, you know, I read a slew on that, uh, but it didn't really have a how-to, a great guideline, right? And then uh, there, there, there was the ultimate guide to fasting that came out way later. But, you know, by then I was like, well, damn, I'll figure it out, right? I was the type of guy that could uh, that could only fast for like 12, barely fast for 12 hours for my blood work, okay? I thought that was a huge torture just to get my blood work. So to think that I did that, um, so I just started building slowly. I just started building every week to get that um, fasting muscle up. And I did, and I actually tracked it a lot. And this is why my program, you know, is there is to get, to, to get that hastened up because I told myself, I was like, why is there no how to guide onto any of these things? So I was like, you know what, if I figure this out, I'm going to make that. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. That's amazing. What was <laughs> happening with your health at the time as you were integrating both a carnivore diet and fasting together? Yeah. So I wasn't going to give up fasting when I, when I saw uh, Dr. Baker again, and I was like, I'm just going to carnivore. And uh, I, I just kept on with the fasting. And that's when things really took off. I mean, I was PRing personal record every week from there on. It was unreal. And this was working out in the fasted state. And I just kept on pushing that fasted state workout uh, wondering when I'm going to break. And I went with curiosity because I was like, you know what? I'm probably going to pass out, but this would be a funny story if I do. I just kept on pushing, 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 and I've never passed out yet. So I was like, 
there's something that doesn't make sense here. Of course, I'm reading all these uh, fasting uh, books and all that kind of stuff, but all of them are like, you know, science minded, but not like reality, uh, you know, how you're feeling to go through it, you know, what goes on through your mind. And uh, I knew with the carnivore diet, it didn't take me long to figure out that nourishment is going to be a very important part as much as the fasting too. So early on, I figured that out and that's, I, I feasted and fasted pretty much. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Jason Fung, you're right about his book. It, it's not a how-to guide, but it does explain the science. You would think, yeah. you know, if I'm not eating, I'm doing fasted workouts. I'm not going to have access to energy. He explained it so well, what's actually happening metabolically inside the body. And, you know, yes. at the time I had a client who was doing weekday fasts. He would eat on Sunday night. He wouldn't eat again until Friday. And I trained him Tuesday and Friday mornings. So he'd be hungry on Tuesday. On Friday, he'd come into the gym and PR deadlifts. And it would almost like make no sense to me. And, and it's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it, that's how I got into low carb anyway. Was, I would do metabolic tests on people who were doing fasting and their metabolisms were several hundred calories higher than they should have been. Yet these people weren't eating all that many calories. It just broke my brain. And so I so much appreciate Jason Fung and all his work to explain that. But you're right. It, 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 that's not a how-to guide. It gives some ideas, but it doesn't really tell you any protocols or anything like that. So what what about that made you eventually get into coaching? <laughs> so actually with coaching, I wasn't planning on get, getting into coaching. So when MeetRx came about, I found out about it uh, like uh, about two months, two months later after it got created. And I was looking at the side, joined in, you know, member stuff. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to support Dr. Baker and uh, and become a coach, but not do anything, right? So I, I got the certificate and I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit on it. And uh, I don't, you know, BNS, right? You saw him. Who, who's that? I'm sorry. BNS. He, you know, I'm he not familiar a, with that. Okay. He has a great channel, BNS Goku Great. But uh, BNS no, I'm saw not familiar me, with that. Right. He saw my picture, and I'll have to introduce you to him. Uh, he saw my picture uh, online, my because you know I, I would put out testimonies and just set, set these things out. So he saw it, and he's like, "Look, dude, you got to become a coach. You know what? I'm going to tell you what. You're. I want you to not only finish up the coaching because I was just going to sit on it. Right. So that means I wasn't going to do the final test. I was just going to pay for it and just sit on it. Right. And he's like, no, I want you to go through the whole coaching. I'm going to be your first client. That's what he said. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I should do that, but he totally encouraged me and got me to go through it. And I did. And I coached him as the first client. And when I put it out there in the portal, I started getting a lot of uh, uh, coaching requests. So that's how I become a coach. Yeah, that's amazing. I think it's important to point out that you also had and still have a day job. So the coaching is on the side. And I'm also a coach for MeetRx, which turned into Rivero, and people can still book me all over the world. And I still take appointments, even though the pay is quite low for those. It's just fun to meet people and help them along their way. Um, but but yeah, that, to, to add on coaching to what you were already doing would have been a real challenge. And I remember when I first got on there, seeing all the different profiles of all the different coaches, you were always at the top for being the most popular. So how did you, how did you get so popular? What were you doing that was different than any of the rest of us were doing? Um, as far as, uh, I really think my before and after kind of speaks for itself. And of course, all of the, all of the issues I've gone through, uh, I also was probably the only one that was willing to speak uh, do the coaching uh, carnivore and fasting at the time. Later on, Rivera started going into the fasting also. I mean, Amino X, but uh, early on, they were just strict carnivores. So I think that was the edge that I had. Uh, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I was always, um, I was always the top coach at that time. Yeah, that's fantastic. So generally speaking, when somebody is moving towards a carnivore diet and they're seeking out a coach, you probably notice this as well. The, the, the person is already kind of pro carnivore. It's not necessarily like a vegan that wants to argue with you. It's somebody who's looked this up and they need some guidance and they need some help with some things. They just don't know how to get going or a lot of people just simply need some validation or just somebody to bounce some ideas off of. So, so what were some common pitfalls or questions that you had to answer for somebody who is coming up to this diet, maybe for the first time and just didn't understand how to get the principles right to execute this really well? Yeah. So one of the biggest thing that I lead through my clients personally, I let, I literally have a weekly, how you're going to feel plan <laughs> and how to, how to actually execute it properly. 
you know, at first people are like, you always hear that on the forum, you can't do carnivore wrong. And they spit on the idea of coaching and all that. And I'm like, yeah, you can. I've done it wrong before. Okay. So the biggest criteria that I've had as a coach that I've noticed that people do wrong most of the time on carnivore is under eat. So I made sure that was taken care of on the front end. That first two weeks, I told them how critical it is to do that. And then that's, so I started building it week by week and noticing when, when I started noticing slowly that my clients had a pattern. All of them started having like a certain pattern, how, how quickly, and it was an average pattern. Some of them wouldn't get out of certain things till later, but it didn't matter. I started noticing a pattern and I started recording those patterns. And those patterns became my calendars nowadays. That would be super helpful for somebody. One of the things I noticed, exactly the same thing really, is that people are so used to not only things that are very complex, they can't wrap their mind around the simplicity of carnivore, and they're they're under eating. They're exactly the way you said it. Like they've been so used to measuring, portion controlling, yes. counting things, macros, whatever you want to do. And so they, they want to kind of get by on a minimal amount of food. And so that will be something that I will start out with people as well as say like, okay, for the first time in your life, give yourself permission to be not just full, but satiated, really, truly satiated. Do not eat six eggs if you think you can have seven. Do not yes. have two burger patties if you could have had a little bit of butter or added some, you know, air fried chicken wings to it or whatever. Like you have to give yourself permission to be fully, truly satiated. Is, is that kind of what you mean by you say that people are under eating? Yes, absolutely. So here, here's the thing, because that, that happened to me too. Of course, you know, we all went through this kind of journey because you, you think the less you eat, the quicker this progress will get, right? And that's just an automatic uh, fallacy. Uh, what, what I noticed, by the way, I use a little different term. Uh, Dr. Barry actually uh, coined that term early on, but he doesn't use it anymore, but comfortably stuffed, you know? And uh, that's what I actually use because satiated has a connotation of like, I eat and it's like, I'm not quite full yet. I'm not, you know, uh, I could eat another bite, but it's, 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 yeah, I'm good. That's that's so I, I've always been scared. So I've noticed with terms is very important. Comfortably stuffed. I used to use uh, Thanksgiving stuff every time, but Thanksgiving stuff was a problem because people would overdo it and have GERD and have a lot of issues. So early on, I did mess up a little bit because I was overstuffing them. That's not good either. So comfortably stuffed, meaning that you're stopped where you're just like popping, but you're not going to have any negative repercussion from it later on. Yeah, no, that's a great way to explain it. I'll I'll try to explain it to people like, look, I, I, I eat a carnivore diet when I go to a Brazilian steakhouse. I make this mistake nice. every time. I think I'm going to be there for hours. I go really hungry. The food's incredible. It's so good. And there comes this point every time. I don't know why it always surprises me. Like 45 minutes or 60 minutes of sitting there eating delicious food. The food, it just it, you have an aversion. It doesn't look that good anymore. You think you're going to be there all afternoon and you have yeah. to leave and go home because you're done. Yeah. Here's the other fallacy that a lot of people do not understand. They think no matter how they start the carnivore diet, that that is exactly how they're going to eat for the rest of their carnivore journey. And that is absolutely not true. So people are so scared to eat a lot at first because they think, oh my God, if I keep eating like this much all the time, I'm going to be like three to 500 pounds. And that is not true. When, the, when you feel the total satiety of meat food and you're saturated, eventually your body tells you, I just want to eat less. I cannot keep eating like this. And that's where I realized that that's the way to do it because it kind of dinged on my head, especially with my past experience and watching other, other, uh, other clients is that why can't we let the body lead us instead of our mind lead us instead of telling ourselves to lower our calories that our bodies tell us lower our calories. Right. That's and it's right. worked. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. So maybe this is a good time to bring up your talk that you, that you had in, in Austin. This is starting to drift into that. As far as the conversation priming, feasting and fasting. Tell us how you came up with those terms and what you mean by each of those. Yeah. Uh, so feasting and fasting means, you know, you're pretty much eating as much as, uh, as uh, comfortably stuffed as you can so that you can have comfortable 
uh, fasting. But the priming piece was very important because without the priming piece, you can't set yourself up for proper feasting and fasting from there. I, I use the ana analogy of uh, filling up a car, ga a gas tank. You fill it up all the way full, and then when it's full, it's fully primed, right? When it's fully primed, it takes a while for it to go down. So that means you can actually you can actually take a good hit. So you can have a lot of stress, and then you're still not craving. You can have a lot of you can have a lot of uh, 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 chances of under eating by accident or whatever, and it still won't affect you because you're properly primed. The idea is to make sure you're always at that full tank and knowing when you start uh, reducing. So priming became important. Priming, I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to keep it simple for people to get it. And priming, all it is, is eating three meals a day plus for the first week. So in our snacks is included and actually having coffee or tea if you have coffee or tea for dessert. That part, nobody really understood, right? The other three meals, they, they, they wrap their heads on pretty easy. That coffee or tea for dessert, people go, they go kind of crazy on that. They're like, I can't do this. And I'm like, you know why you can fast until one o'clock all the time and think that it's a hunky dory? Because you're suppressing your appetite. Why would you want to do that? If you're trying to listen to your body properly, get the coffee as a dessert. I'm not telling you to get rid of the coffee or tea or anything like that. Just do it after your meal. So that changed the whole ballgame. Okay, awesome. So is priming just something that you do when you're first starting on a carnivore diet? Yes. So uh, that I like I like that. As a matter of fact, I even like priming for some uh, some experienced carnivores that uh, feel like they might have a tendency to under eat because they're just used to being hungry all the time. And they 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 I've had experienced carnivore that's telling me that you know they they never went a day where they don't feel hungry all the time. And I'm like, yeah, you need to prime. You know, okay. yes, it might be miserable, but you got to get that gas tank filled up. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so it's a cool tool that can be used really anywhere in somebody's journey, but especially when somebody is getting started or they're just chronically under eating. So that would be the first week, two weeks. What's kind of the average time that somebody's going to live there? Priming is a it's a three week process actually. So the second week is actually where you're just eating three meals with no snacks. You're getting prepped up for for less eating, um, and then the third week is actually two meals and uh, with no snacks. And it should be actually where your body's begging to go to those two meals. Uh, the idea behind it is getting you ready for the fast from there. And the way you test your priming is you go into a 23-1 water fat a water only fast, and that's how you test it. How well you've done. If you're not able to do any of those, whether it's two mads for seven days um, with just uh, with just uh, without snacks, then obviously you're not ready. So that's how you find out whether you're primed. Okay, so you almost like test out of it, and that way, you know, you got a three week average where most people can do that cadence and get get it on in three weeks. But if other people are lagging behind, maybe they need a few more weeks of getting used to two meals a day. That that test out would be a way that they would know they need to live there a little bit longer. Exactly. And also for experienced carnivores, you know, I, I noticed for them about a week is good enough for them or to a week and a half. So, you know, it, it, it does depend. And I don't want people to override by any means their, their crew. So in other words, I don't want them to overstuff themselves where they're sick either. So the idea is you're not overdoing priming. You don't want to overdo priming. You don't want to do it too often. It's not a good idea. You want that gas tank to go down. You know, so it, it, it's a balance, but it's an art too. To me, the beauty is when you start doing this and I see this aha light bulb moment, whenever people prime, they're like, I get it now. I get it what it means to be fully nourished. And that's the concept that I want them to feel what full nourishment feels like and what fasting on a full nourishment cycle feels like. I love that. That's amazing. Okay. So as, as we're going through the program, we're getting better at priming, we're kind of getting past that. Tell us about the feasting. What, what kind of patterns do you want people to get into when they do choose to eat? Yeah. So when they choose to eat, first of all, one of the biggest th tricks I have, if you're fasting, especially on my program, because we, we go as high as 72, I want you to be able to eat that same portion meal that you eat normally without any repercussions. That's also another key sign you're ready for that fast. If you're starting to have problems like brain fogs, fatigue, uh, cravings after a fast, 
any of those, you're not ready for that fast. Your body is just not ready to get there. So why would you want to push it extra hard? Don't get me wrong. There are special circumstances. For example, you know, if you have uh, Dr. Jason Fung will put people on 14 day fast right away. I get that. That That's a whole, that's more medical. I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with people who can do constant fasting all the time. Okay. And get the benefit awesome. of that. Yeah, gotcha. So we kind of need to reverse our thinking then, rather than trying to force people into fasting, we need to overfeed, prime people, overfeed them, get them into a pattern where they are sufficient, they're sufficiently taking in calories and nutrients when they do eat to then allow the fasting to come in and be something that's a lot more organic and, and not forced. Does, do I have that correct? Exactly. So what we know from the mice studies, for example, uh, Walter Longo made the mice study, he actually lowered the caloric restrictions on some mice. And then the other ones, uh, the other ones, he actually got them to fast. And under lower restrictions, yeah, their bodies look better, they were leaner, but they didn't have any lifespan. On the ones that actually was forced to fast, but no calorie restriction allowed, so, you know, there were days that they, they would fast and then, uh, and then they would fully eat whatever they want they had longer lifespan and they their weight was in check and their spurs, everything looked good. So what we need to know is it's about the balance between your feast and the fast. It's not calorie restriction. It's not less calories. All calorie restriction is going to do for you is malnourish you. We go into a malnourished state. People think that they come in fat. They're like, I'm obviously fully nourished. No, it doesn't work that way. You're actually you're actually chronically uh, malnourished, and that's why I tell them. I know that doesn't make sense, but when you come to me, four or five hundred pounds, you're chronically malnourished. Yeah, you would think that would be such a paradox. It's definitely not one that you see in nature, and this does follow a very natural pattern. If you look at the patterns of other animals and how they hunt, if you think about the tiger, when the tiger gets hungry. It's time to hunt. It's not even necessarily time to eat. It's time to hunt. This is why fasted workouts work really well. You should do a lot of your workouts in the fasted state. You'll have better energy and mental clarity. You'll be able to lift more. I think you'll be able to perform sports a lot better. I've noticed my hockey games and cycling is way better when I'm in the fasted state. So there's the tiger. It goes on the hunt. When it kills something, it feasts. It takes as many of the most nutrient and calories it can find. It got first choice of all of that stuff. So go in and eat whatever it can until it's so full that it's just going to go back into the shade somewhere and take a nap and it will naturally fast because it doesn't need to be eating. It doesn't need three meals and three snacks. It doesn't need to hunt six times for, you know, six times a day for yogurt and granola bars in between meals. So, so we see that pattern in other animals. It just makes a lot of sense that we could do the same thing and really thrive with that. That's right. We can mimic it. Now, just to be clear, I want people to understand this. So we don't come in metabolically healthy. What this process will get us metabolically healthy. In other words, don't come in and expect to just go right into feasting and fasting because it's not going to work. You have to prime your body to get to that point, get it used to getting there. You know, the 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 tiger or whatever, he, you know, they're this is this is this is what they do, right? They're metabolically healthy, but we come so broken that we actually have to fix ourselves to get our metabolism working again properly before we can actually do it properly later on. That's a really good point. We're dealing with two different metabolically healthy examples when we talk right. about that. Now, now, there's a little bit of controversy to this, although I don't really think there is. Is this something that can be done safely long-term? What is that? The feasting and fasting? Yes, yeah. feasting and fasting. So, yes. So I, I am a big proponent of alternate day fast. Okay. So I, I was doing it, uh, let's see, uh, it's about, I've been doing it for four years, but only six months out of the year. Cause you know, I, I, at first I was scared because nobody's really done it for that long, but I was doing it literally for six months out of the year and six months I would just do carnivore only. And I saw the shifts enough with the first three years to notice that I actually get worse when I stay on carnivore only compared to the alternate day fast. So this year I'm going to go through the whole year alternate day fasted. There will be breaks here and there. Like for example, at KetoCon, I took like a, a 10 day break and uh, just uh, ate liberally carnivore, of course. Um, and then now I'm right back on the alternate day uh, fasting, but there's so much benefit on that alternate day fasting that I was like, I don't see why I would not do this as a lifestyle. 
So this is what I actually try to get teach people that my program only teaches you the tip of the iceberg. And then there's the alternate day fast part to get to. It's a true mind shift because can you imagine socially how that does? It's not hard to do, but the social aspect is really the hard problem. Oh, I'm not going to eat tomorrow. Uh, yeah, sorry, mom. I know it's your birthday. <laughs> I'll have, you know what I mean? So there's 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 a lot of issues there. Uh, and of course, for yourself, it's, it's, it's a cognitive shift because you've never done something like this before. But that's where I really, truly shown in my in my healing. Yeah, gotcha. Do you get concerned when people take their fasting too far? Like when, I know you mentioned already 72 hour fast. When, when is a fast taken too far? And when do you start to have concerns um, ab about fasting too long? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So th that's the thing. A lot of people think, uh, you know, and, and I've been caught up into this too. Hey, a little bit of fasting is great. A lot more is a lot better, right? <laughs> and that's obviously not the case. So there had to be modalities that I did put in that actually said, hey, let's find out if you're in the mountain, you know, getting to the malnourished state, right? How do we find out? There are actually key signs that you can look at and go by to find out that you're getting, you're sliding into more of malnourishment. So I like to watch for that, but uh, there, there is a little bit of issue. So anything above 72 hours, for example, 72 hours are very doable. If you're doing it like once a week, you can get away. I mean, not once a week, once a month, you can get away do, with doing it twice a month with the alternate day fasting. Alternate day fasting is very doable. Uh, but when you start getting into the five day, 10 day range, all of those, those become a totally different story. What happens is you, you, your, your body literally starts shutting down certain things. So really, and honestly, it goes into a stasis mode. So those are different types of talk, right? And of course, with, with longer fasts like that, 14 days or so, there will be refeeding problems, but I don't teach any of that. The, and there are separate benefits for those like apoptosis and, uh, you know, whether you're deep in cancer or whatnot. So, th but that's a whole different modality. And unfortunately, I really think if you're going to go into the longer day fast, you may want somebody to watch over you. But with the short day fast up to 72 hours, totally safe in my book. No uh, refusal. Up to 72. Up to 72. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, you yeah, can I do think... a five day here and there, but I'm just saying cycling it is a bad idea. Yeah. Okay. I, I've been used to saying that it really like anything inside of 24 hours is perfectly safe. It's nice to know that that can be extended as long as it's not overdone. You're paying attention to those signs and symptoms, right? Well, actually, it, it's funny you say this. So um, 24 hours would be great for keto people. So that is absolutely correct on what you just said. Uh, for carnivores, we can go much longer. Good so, point. <laughs> right. That's a whole different ballgame. Good point. What what do you think makes the biggest difference? It, where, where we're very, uh, the biggest difference is the nutrient density. We last longer on, on smaller amounts of fuel because of the density of the, say, muscle and uh, uh, the, the end of life force. Let's be honest. You know, you get a huge amount of life force from, say, you know, a ribeye. And all of that matters. It lasts you a lot longer. You're not draining it like you would, like, you know, a, a piece of dead plant. Yeah, that very well explained. I love that you pointed that out. Um, I also want to know how are people's tastes changing? Do you notice a pattern in the types yes. of foods that people are eating? I, it's, it's so funny to me. It seems to happen, especially with women. I notice a very specific pattern. We all know a carnivore diet is animal product. So it, it could be fish, it could be chicken, could be pork, could be beef, could be all kinds of different things that are animal products. But something, something interesting emerges with a lot of people. Can you explain how people's tastes change? Yeah. I, I, and, you know, I started taking advantage of that because I, I, I knew that at, at first I'm like, look, eat every type of animal products you can even add cheese. OK, have as much spices as you want. You know, like I said, everybody thinks that the way they eat today is the way they're going to continue eating. Never true. Every single time I start seeing people dropping their spice, dropping their uh, chicken, fish, starting to go into more red meat um uh whether it's ground beef or 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 steaks 
um, if they if they could afford steaks, that's where they go. But all of them have that same pattern. And there's some people, rare people, that will even give up their salt. I'm one of them. So it, it's very interesting how we also eat differently. You know, at first we're eating for pleasure, sheer pleasure. And then later on, and I'm sure you know about this, Casey. I mean, you, I, I eat because I have to eat. That's it. It's, I, I'm not saying I don't enjoy my food. I love my food. But I eat because, oh. It's time to eat. Okay, let me get that over with and then get life going. So I spend very little time even for the pleasure of food. Yeah, it's amazing how that changes. At first, you know, making different recipes and your, you know, all the ingredients you were talking about and making the grains and like, yes. you think that's fun and it's not. It's like this inconvenience and fasting becomes so convenient. You just, yes. you're not spending time in the kitchen. A meal is a frozen burger patty in the air fryer. And it's, yeah. just, it's so simple and yeah i just i see people so much gravitate towards the red meat more eggs maybe more butter and get away yeah. a lot more from some of those other sources like chicken or turkey or whatever they're doing in the very beginning that you know maybe they they, they think they like that the most in the beginning but over time i really notice people especially women start to have such an increased um taste for red meat red meat yeah absolutely no question about it and also fat the the other thing that i've also noticed so it when I coached people about doing their coffee as dessert or tea as dessert or whatever, they start giving that up too. There is a component of saying that our hunger is really driven by, by the fact that we, that we're, we're hungry. Our hunger is because we're hungry all the time. So we want to create these wonderful recipes. It depends on how hungry we really are. As satiated as we are, fully nourished, me and you, Casey, then it doesn't matter anymore. We don't want to pretty it up. We don't care about it. We just want to just eat and get it over with. Enjoy the fasting time, not enjoy the eating time anymore because we are right. fully nourished. There's a big difference. But when you're starving all the time, like the, I don't know if you read about the Minnesota um, starvation experiment, but yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, remember they, they were, they were, those guys were so under, undernourished and they were under calorie restriction that they were, they were looking at magazines like, uh, like cookbook magazines, like it was porn, right? Yep. You starve somebody enough, that's what you'll do. You'll want to cook decadent things, have imagination for food like that. But if you're fully nourished, there's no reason for any of that. And I'm Crazy, glad you huh? pointed it out too. Yeah, no. And I'm glad you pointed it out too. It's the food time. It's the time you spend on the food. It's not like the food is, is not delicious because you didn't spend so much time and money on the ingredients. It is. The food is amazing. It tastes great. I, I don't get sick of having steak and eggs for dinner. Like, really good. Okay. So I wonder if you can comment, um, being in this world for as long as you have, we just got back from Austin for KetoCon 2023. Can you comment on what you observe, just, just you know, observationally, subjectively, watching the movement towards carnivore? What things did you observe at that conference? That was crazy, right? And being a KetoCon conference, I was like thinking, oh my gosh, there's probably going to be keto stuff everywhere and everybody's talking about keto. Man, it was majority carnivore. I was like, all of these carnivore stars, and I was like, what is going on? It's almost like we hijacked their conference. We That's what I felt. Did. <laughs> yeah, we kind of did, right? We yeah. kind of did. And it was consumer-driven. It was what the right. people wanted. The, all the packed right. presentations, the main event halls, the lines for autographs and signed books and pictures were the longest for all the carnivores. It's what yeah. they wanted. And it became more about biohacking on the vendors then it was really about food. You know, yeah, you had the carnivore bar, but again, that was carnivore. Uh, so many things was carnivore, even the meter, for example, that was there. You know, all, all those were carnivore led stuff. I, I didn't see a single vegetable, you know, thing. Uh, I, I did see supplements, but even then, I mean, it, it, it wasn't really touting any vegetables or anything like that they weren't getting any attention whatever booths they had were not were not that difficult to walk up to where like peterson farm serving yeah. sausage was packed sausage. You know? yes yes and the <laughs> so bacon. much attention on oh man so much attention on the meter that you mentioned and the carnivore bar and yeah, yeah. it's so so robin does such an amazing job with keto i'm so glad she's keeping it going i know that it's going in the direction of more of the hacking i believe it already has a title that's related to that next year 
hack your health is a good term. And, and that's great. It's also really exciting to think that there is a possibility that somebody could put on a carnivore conference like that, and it would be well attended with a lot of people who are interested in it. So I thought that was very exciting. That was not something I was really expecting, but it was really cool to observe. That was awesome. And I, I think that that's what made it that much more fun because I was like, uh, I, I couldn't believe the, 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 the star power from, from the carnival world that was there. Yeah, and thinking that, that you were amazing. a big part of it. You were a big part of it. You were able to move this message forward years ago and create these protocols that have really helped people that has ripples, right? Like the one person you helped three years ago who you don't talk to anymore, who knows if they're still doing it or not, but maybe they have, maybe they shared it with their friends and family, maybe their coaches too. Like, it's cool to know that you were a big part of moving that message forward and when it was in its relative infancy. Actually, I've had many coaches and also, uh, you know, that, that I've coached, uh, many became coaches, uh, some influencers. Um, so you're right. I, I have impacted people's lives enough for that. So uh, it, it's you should, a great thing. You should be very proud. You should be very proud of yourself as far as that goes. It was a lot of hard work and figuring things out yourself and deciding that you were going to take your free time and your spare time to put some of this stuff together and help people. And so you, I, I hope you're very proud of that. It, it, it was wonderful to meet you. It's been a wonderful conversation today. Raymond, where do you want people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Yeah, the best way is uh, through the Sacred Butter Gal, if you can, uh, through Mighty Networks uh, uh, on Bella's platform. I usually am there, but you can also DM me on, at Raymond Nazon over in IG, Facebook. Uh, you can also email me if you'd like, rnazon at gmail.com. Pretty much just type my name in anything and in any Google thing, you'll see, you'll, you'll see me there. You will see it and you will see that before and after picture is one of the first things that really popped up and that is striking. I'm glad you brought that up. That was a, an amazing difference. It's so cool when somebody not only loses weight, but loses weight like we've been talking about the right way and they, they lose what looks like 30 pounds when they only lost the 10 like you. Like you can really see it. It's very striking and it's very easy to maintain when you're doing it the right way. And again, you've been such a big part of that. So Raymond Nazan, thank you so very much for everything that you've done and for healing yourself and for learning about enough to coach other people and share your message and, and, and for the time you took to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Casey. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Such an honor. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio. One second. Dude, that was great. I hope you liked it. Yeah. That was great. Awesome.